be crowded. So, welcome and thank you for being here today. Um, my name is Kenny Turk. I am the executive director of Turk Group Global. This is our vice president, Kara West, and my clinical director as well. And um, we're really excited to be with you guys today. And hopefully, you're going to share some in important information and information that's interesting, um, entertaining, but also will help you um, understand why we're so passionate about doing social work with groups. We work primarily with children and adolescents, and um, there's going to be four major things that I want to convey to you today as far as objectives go. The first is how does trauma impact the autonomic nervous system? How does a lack of lived experience affect the autonomic nervous system as it relates to social and emotional intelligence and social and emotional learning? Um, and what we can do about it? And then why this is so important for doing social work with groups and the social context that we bring to this program called Dirt Group or the Dirt Group Paradigm. So the Dirt Group Paradigm is a resiliency informed um, children's mental health application based in social emotional learning but in the context of a gardening, farming, foods, and creative arts project. Um, just a little bit of history. Um, I've been working in children's mental health for 32 years. Um, I grew up on my family farm. Uh, we've been there since 1875. Um, and one of the main goals for Dirt Group Global, our mission, part of our mission, is to redistribute land. Um, one of the most important things about this work and creating the social context is in order for us to be able to we have to be able to grow food with the kids that we work with. And so many times, what, what um, we've been on the same place for 18, since 1875, but before that, the Dakota Nation and the Sioux Nation were inhabiting that land. But this idea of land ownership is almost kind of strange. What it does is really prevents a lot, of, um, a lot of social justice because there's power in that, and that's equity. And so Dirt Group, anybody can plant a seed, anybody can grow food, but not everybody has the land in which to do that. So I just want you to keep that in mind as we go through this today, because one of the things that we do is we partner with other um, programs, other landowners in different communities that we're in. Um, right, oops, not yet. Oh, sorry. Did I do that? No, that would be. Okay, I'll tell you. Yeah. Okay, so, oh, no, no. We're gonna go back. Oh. I got you. Okay, so we're in, these five communities in in um, Minnesota, um, Wilmer was just actually highlighted two weeks ago in the New York Times. Um, Wilmer is a very diverse community, 37 different ethnicities represented there. I talk fast, but I'm not from New York. I'll try to keep it, I'll try to remember to keep it. <coughs> but we work with a whole variety of, of kiddos, but mostly the kids that we work with have really complex trauma histories. And so Dirk Group being a resiliency informed means that we know how to treat the trauma. We also know how to treat kids that aren't necessarily impacted by trauma per se, but that they also <laughs> struggle with emotional and behavioral dysregulation as, a res as, a, as because of their lack of social emotional learning opportunities. Daniel Siegel is a psychiatrist out of UCLA. Many of you probably know his work, but he talks about Social emotional learning only happens through hands-on experiences, through lived experiences. It doesn't happen any other way. And so when we hear about other social emotional learning programs in schools especially, it's not really the hands-on stuff that we're talking about. It's not those ingredients that are part of neuroplasticity, which I'll talk about in a little while. Um, okay. So a um, little bit of history. So um, when I was a little kid, I was 10 years old, my cousin Mark is biracial. Um, my, my uncle uh, is African American, Chuck, and my aunt Helen uh, was my dad's only sibling. And I didn't know because I grew up on my family farm that not everybody around me was having the same lived experience. I assumed that what I knew was what I knew and everybody else had the same kind of thing. And so we had people from all over the globe. I'm the youngest of 10. And so my oldest sister um, went to the University of Chicago and went to Loyola, worked as a, in a settlement house as an attorney. And she would bring all sorts of folks to the farm. Well, Mark and I grew up, he's closer to me than my two brothers, and closer to me than my twin brother, actually. And um, we were at Como Park in St. Paul, which is where he lived, and we were just having a great time this summer. And two kids rode by on their bicycles, and they called him an Oreo cookie. And I didn't know what that meant at the time, but I knew that it crushed him. I saw it in his face, I saw it in his body, and so I yelled at these two kids, a phrase of the day was bite and fry. I still don't really know what that means, but I yelled at them and they came back on their bicycles and they pulled knives on us. Pretty traumatic experience, but that was my first experience of realizing that somehow I couldn't protect Mark 
because his color was different than mine. And because of that, I, I could step out of the way and be not noticed, but he was not going to be invisible to those kids. And that was my first experience at age 10 trying to sort that out. Um, again, when I was 10, Patrick Lebrano, right here from Brooklyn, New York, some of you look like you might be the same vintage as me. He was in a 1972 Ragu spaghetti commercial where the dad goes, now that's Italian, and the little boy in the background goes, now that's Italian. That's my buddy, Patty Ragu. Okay. Coming full circle to Brooklyn. Um, we're staying in Brooklyn right now, and he thinks we gotta bring Dirt Group to Brooklyn. He, Patrick claims to be the first Dirt Group kid. He went through all sorts of trials and tribulations, what we would normally call an at-risk youth. I prefer the term upstream youth because they have to swim harder, they have to paddle harder, there's a lot more challenges and stuff than what mainstream youth. And so you'll hear me talk a little bit today about the mainstream youth and what I'm gonna talk about specifically with them is a lack of lived experience for the social emotional learning to take place. And then finally, this young man right here um, was interning with me at the time, but he has Asperger's. And before his internship with me, he was a client of mine. And I knew so importantly that his social context was so limited, he was going to online school, he had been bullied, he couldn't, he couldn't be in the classroom, it was too tough on him. And so then he went to college, but he also did it online. But as we work to help him learn, practice, and master these really important skills through the Dirt Group paradigm, he became an honor student. He's now a licensed social worker. And so I just want to state that as kind of some evidence, anecdotal evidence, if you will, about the power of this, of this work in this modality. Um, some of these pictures, all these pictures, are foods that we've grown, the heirloom, the garlic, tomatoes, uh, the gar heirloom tomatoes, garlic, all sorts of herbs. Um, all sorts of carrots. This is a this is a drone shot of one of our gardens, our main experiential garden. So we have five gardens in all sorts in all of these different cities that we're in. Um, you can go ahead. And uh, and so there's a lot of really visceral activity. Okay. What I want to talk to you about right now is how trauma impacts the autonomic nervous system, and also how the autonomic <laughs> nervous system and social emotional intelligence and social emotional learning kind of fit together. So. You can go ahead to the, well, I should mention, um, Aristotle, we are what we repeatedly do. Dan Siegel talks about that a lot too, about our intentionally focused, redundant, experiential efforts in terms of how, about neuroplasticity and how we can heal, develop new skill sets, develop new neural pathways, etc. So I want you to keep that in mind as we move through this. I feel like I should do this because I'm going to be bump, bumping back all over the place. Oh, yeah. Okay. No. Okay. So I want you to just look over here for a second. Um, how many of you are familiar with the autonomic nervous system and the functions? A couple of you, a few of you, okay. So um, how many of you understand chronic stress and trauma and what that works with? How many of you work with children and adolescents? Okay, so when the autonomic nervous system is experiencing trauma or overwhelming chronic stress, it could be a single event, it could be a, a repetition of events that happens to us, our body tends to have this fight-flight response, right? We have this action which is meant to protect us. It's meant to um, preserve life, to keep, us, um, to keep us safe. So the fight-flight response is that which keeps us out of, out of danger, right? But what happens is when this is happening constantly over and over and over, imagine a refugee, imagine someone in a situation of domestic violence, sexual abuse, etc. What happens is this sympathetic state is activated in a fight mode. But our bodies aren't meant to stay in that place, right? It's supposed to be a quick response so that we can flee, get away from danger, etc. But when it's chronic stress, what ends up happening is it causes it causes the dorsal vagal state to activate this other branch of the nervous system. And what that is responsible for is our freeze mode, our shutdown, mobilization, collapse. And so oftentimes we see kids that don't seem to be motivated, or adults they see with depression and anxiety, we see them kind of stuck in a place, right? They're not able to, we can't figure out why they can't get off the couch. And it's because they're existing in this dorsal vagal state where they're not actually able to bounce back. And that's because the ventral vagal branch is inhibited. The ventral vagal, vagal branch is probably where most of us who are not experiencing trauma or chronic stress live most of the day, right? This is uh, responsible for social engagement, our sense of safety and restoration, our sense of being comfortable, 
our sense of wanting to be in relationship with other people. People that have experienced chronic stress and chronic stress trauma tend to go back and forth between the sympathetic state and the dorsal vagal state. And that's kind of where they sit. And that's kind of like poison to the body. The adrenaline, the cortisol, it tends to overwhelm our nervous system and keeps us more in this state. We understand that when someone is in the dorsal vagal state for too long, that's where despair is. That's where suicidality takes place. So how do we get to these different places? What I'd like to talk about is how we increase this opportunity. And again, the empower of social work with groups, that social context, and how come the social context is so very important? Because if my social context is just simply living in that, that space, in that dorsal vagal state, or in that fight-flight mode, I'm not very comfortable. I'm not able to do a lot of things. I'm not able to feel a sense of well-being or resilience. And so we're going to go into the next, go ahead to the next slide, Kara. Please, thank you. <coughs> so the ventral vagal branch is responsible for social engagement. And I want to point out how much screen time, are you all familiar with Dr. David Walsh, his work from the University of Minnesota? Maybe not. Um, so he, did a, he was the first person in the study on immediate consumption, screen time consumption. And in 2004, um, kids ages 8 to 18 in the United States of America were consuming 40 hours of screen time a week mm -hmm. on average. In 2010, the Kaiser Family Foundation did a follow-up study. That study revealed it was over 55 hours of screen time. Come on in. Over 55 hours of screen time in 2012, and I don't remember who did the study, it's up over 60 hours a week. So the screen time consumption, people think, oh, it's not a big deal. But what it does is it inhibits the five cranial nerves that are responsible for social engagement, that are all part of our facial, um, our, their, their ocular nerves and our, our cheeks. It's all those things that, the nonverbal stuff, that when you see somebody and you're in that communication mode, it's how we kind of read each other, right? But when we have that kind of screen time consumption, and even in the schools, that is simply incredibly limited to have that experience, right? That social context is missing. And so when we're doing all of the screen time, all the technology, even we're doing, doing technology today, those five cranial nerves, numbers five, seven, nine, 10, and 11 are inhibited, they're shut off. They don't, even, they don't work. And so if I'm just simply consuming screen time at 60 plus hours a week, I don't have that experience to be able to learn about other people's facial expressions or my own. And so that inhibits, again, the, the ventral vagal branch from being activated in that sense of safety, social engagement, because we're not living there, right? How many of you um, spend a lot of time on the screen doing notes on the phone, et cetera, right? And you can probably tell anecdotally that you kind of want to maybe not do that as much. You want to be able to be with your family, your friends, et cetera, to have that experience, to have that time. Well, that doesn't happen for many of the kids. The kids that we work with that have experienced so much trauma because of that and because of the screen time consumption, because of their isolation, they're not engaging those five cranial nerves. Now, there are 12 cranial nerves in the autonomic nervous system. All of them are responsible for seeking food, finding food, chewing food, swallowing food, and digesting food, as well as eliminating food. It's kind of strange to me. It was surprising. I just learned that about a year ago. I didn't realize that how important it was that we're growing food together with these kids, and it's all related to all 12 cranial nerves. Huh. We put them in a social context that allows them to be interactive with other kids. There's no screens involved. They're doing this hands-on work. It's very much sensory integrated. And so all of their cranial nerves are activated. We can go ahead to the next slide. Thank you. So let's talk about, this is kind of my favorite in a, in a weird sort of way. The autonomic nervous system and social emotional learning is incredibly impacted by the lack of lived experience. When we are 60 hours of screen time a week, or even 40, there's only 168 hours in a week, right? If you just do some simple math, 60 hours of screen time, eight hours a night of sleep, that's another 56. And then you've gotta be at school too. We're very much limited in terms of the amount of time that's left available to have any other social interaction. What's happening is we see this whole group of kids, the younger and younger kids, with suffering from emotional and behavioral dysregulation. The suicide rate is going up and up and up too. The reason that is happening is because they're not having the lived experience necessary for their nervous system to learn, practice, and master these skills to bounce back from these things. Instead, 
they're having this very limited experience where they don't have to deal with frustration, disappointment, perseverance, etc. They're stuck because their social context, or what I'm going to talk about a little bit, they're marinated, their individual ingredients, they're simply missing the necessary opportunities to learn, practice, and master these very important skills. And so we put these kids in a very rich contextual environment that allows them to not only cooperate with each other and grow food together, which is very meaningful, but also having that interaction time. So, why are kids dysregulated? Daniel Siegel would say, if we don't have the opportunities to engage in these activities, these hands-on activities, the social-emotional learning doesn't take place, okay? So, simple math, 60 hours of screen time a week. I don't have the time for that other context. I don't have the time for those experiences, right? And so it really inhibits that, but also it inhibits the ventral vagal branch from activating and feeling that sense of safety, restoration, social engagement. Not only that, I don't really want that, okay? Because when we're not having those lived experiences, we don't even desire that sort of um, thing. How many of you work with people that experience depression or anxiety? Are they isolating a lot? Are they alone a lot? Right. That's because their ventral vagal branch is not engaged. They're existing over here in either the sympathetic state or the dorsal vagal, the fight, flight, freeze, and oftentimes going back and forth. So I'm gonna talk about the mainstream kids for a second, right? Why are these kids dysregulated? They don't have mental health issues, right? Why are school shootings take place? Because this kid doesn't have mental illness, right? It's a mainstream kid, a mainstream human. The reality of it is, is that they didn't have the lived experiences necessary to develop these nervous system exercises to strengthen their nervous system to be able to have that flexibility necessary for the nervous system to operate as it's supposed to. Fight flight is important, right? If we're in a dangerous situation, it's important that we can react quickly to danger. The same thing is true with the freezing. If it, it, it shuts down our body, slows everything down again as a, for, for restoration, but also just for preservation of life. When kids don't have those lived experiences, those mainstream kids, they're dysregulated. They're dysregulated because they don't have those lived experiences. So uh, let's, let's go ahead to the next slide. So what do we do and how do we do it? Go ahead, Karen. So I wanna to talk to you about the marinade for a second. And this is how we combine the theory and the neuroscience. And this will be on your post test as well. Go ahead. So, our theoretical foundations um, and neuroplasticity involve these 14 ingredients, okay? This is the marinade or the social context in which we provide kids that are in dirt group in order for them to learn, practice, and master these skills and to develop social and emotional intelligence. So, experiential learning, hands-on learning, we know that according to the experts, that's the only way that social and emotional intelligence can develop. Social learning theory, monkey see, monkey do, also, those are the two most powerful ways that people, that human beings learn is through experiential and social learning. Symbolic interactionism is a sociology theory that talks about how we attach meaning and symbolism to poignant, meaningful, important events in our lives, and that helps us define our worldview and our perspective. As you can see as we go through the slideshow and all the pictures, and Kara's gonna talk about the nervous system exercises in a little bit, about all of the, the things that are very stimulating that are very interesting. Right now we have a bunch of baby chicks and baby turkeys at the farm. The kids get to hold those baby turkeys and those baby chicks. They get to do the same thing with the greenhouse and the plants. So we'll talk about that in a little bit. But that's all very visceral. That's all very much about creating that symbolism, that meaningful experience. Strength-based theory, social workers, you all know what that is. Ecological systems theory, we all know what that is too. How we as organisms interact between the systems. And then how many of you are familiar with the polyvagal theory by Stephen Porges? Awesome, a couple of you. If I can't recommend anything um, more, more today, it would be to check out Dr. Stephen Porges' work. P-O-R-G-E-S, Stephen is with a P-H. Um, his work on the polyvagal theory started in 1994. He's one of the world's most renowned scientists as it relates to um, social and emotional learning and, and the polyvagal theory has to do with these three branches. In the past, we used to think that these three branches, that there was only two branches, right? The fight, flight, and the freeze. The, the sympathetic state, the sympathetic nervous system, and the parasympathetic nervous system was just thought to be the dorsal branch. Um, in our parasympathetic nervous system, excuse me, in our autonomic nervous system, there's basically two halves, if you will. 
One is the sympathetic, the fight flight mode. The other is a parasympathetic, which is the freeze and the social engagement. The parasympathetic nervous system is responsible for all of our automatic bodily functions. Wound healing, digestion, metabolism, circulation, liver function, all of those things. And they're all subcortical, meaning that they're subconscious. We don't think about those. We don't have to think about those that automatically happen. I'm sure that right now that my circulatory system is working, my metabolism is working, all these things, but I don't have to think about that, right? The interesting part about that is that we have kind of like I, I refer to it as a ninja scanner, okay? Our autonomic nervous system is constantly scanning, and based on our own lived experience, it's going to be different for each one of us. What, what is your name? Michael. Michael. So Michael's experiences might be different than my own, and something might trigger Michael differently than it would me. For example, when we think about PTSD, a lot of times we think about it as it's strictly related to, to war and that kind of situation. But if you think about domestic violence and someone who's experienced psychological trauma or emotional abuse chronically, right, over and over and over, if you think about punching somebody in the arm over and over, kind of like that, it becomes kind of a bruise to the autonomic nervous system. And we go into this collapse mode after enough of that time and we're not able to bounce back from that. When we're in that, in that either sympathetic or dorsal state, the ventral vagal branch social engagement is completely inhibited. It just simply does not work. And so what we do is we put kids in this marinade, if you will, with these ingredients. I'm going to talk about this because all of this is neuroplasticity. And so what the polyvagal theory says is that when we're either in either one of the sympathetic or the dorsal, the fight, flight, or the freeze, we simply can't engage socially. It's not something we desire. It's not something that we even have function about. And so when most of our kids have experienced this complex trauma, many of them haven't been to that space. Social work with groups, and this is why it's so important. We create this experience, this social context for these mainstream and these upstream kids for them to learn, practice, and master these skills in a very meaningful way. And in a sense, we all know, what a, does anybody not know what a marinade is? So a marinade is a combination of ingredients that we soak food in, basically, and it takes on that flavor. We, we used to call it a therapeutic milieu. I like to call it a marinade because we're a bunch of foodies, and it makes more sense to the kids, and we feed the kids the, the same stuff we're going to It's really meaningful to them. When we're in that place, oh, I lost my place. That sometimes happens. We're going to go back to the, to the neuroplasticity. So that social context is so important for them that we have to involve intentionally focused, redundant, experiential, consistent, meaningful, action-oriented, novel and visceral activities in order for them to create new neural pathways. According to Siegel, and then you had Bessel van der Kolk, Peter Levine, etc. this is a summarization of all of their work as it relates to neuroplasticity. Siegel would say it's arousal, emotional arousal, intentionally focused, and redundancy. Those are kind of the three main ones. If you think about what's going on in our political climate today, there's an intentionally focused, redundant, visceral message that's being repeated to disconnect people, to cause emotional harm, okay? That's on a grander scale, right? all the more reason we have to create these social contexts for young people in order for us to help them develop that social emotional intelligence. And so, all of these ingredients combined is what Dirt Group is on a, on a daily basis when we're meeting with these kids. We are setting up each and every treatment plan, each and every um, Dirt Group session, that involves intentionally focused, redundant, experiential, novel, visceral, consistent, meaningful, action-oriented events. Because we know from all of their science and all of this theory, that, that you already know all this theory, right, guys? <coughs> that it creates an opportunity that doesn't exist in their lives for them to learn, practice, and master those skills. Growing up on the farm, that was everything. My first job at the Wilder Foundation in St. Paul after college my boss was super into experiential learning theory. And I'm like, I don't get it. I don't get it, what, what are you talking about? It makes no sense. He goes, well, that's because you grew up on the farm. That's what you did every day. I'm like, well, I know, that's exactly my point. I don't understand why this is so cool. I hated it. I hated gardening as a kid. Okay, so 
But when we do that, it's like, okay, so that makes sense. Experiential learning, well, of course, right? Well, then I read Siegel's stuff, and I read Van Der stuff, and I read Levine's stuff, and I read Porges' stuff, and I'm going, okay, wait a minute. It's the same thing. This is not rocket science, right? This all makes sense. This is very simple math. How do we create a new habit, right? We do it over and over and over. I can tell you that the kettlebells, the weights sitting in front of my television, I can think about them, and I can think about them, and I can think about them. But you can look at me and know that they're not working that way, right? Because we can think about all of this all day long. We can do worksheets. We can talk about it, traditional therapy, etc. This works with adults, too. If we can create this marinade, this context, what we have seen from people healing from their trauma and recovering from that is absolutely amazing. I have a client in a, um, who has an adult adult female who has an ACEs score of nine. And it impacted her life terribly. She almost lost her kids a couple times. Most recently, when I started working with them, we're like, okay, we're gonna do this. I built a garden with them at their house. I, I have permission, but I didn't have time to put the, their pictures in the slides. Well, the boys are in one, but um, they have engaged in these activities. Mom is sober. Mom is healthy, and guess what? Mom is being invited to go talk to people, providers, about her experience and about the autonomic nervous system. And she can come in here and tell you all about the autonomic nervous system, a lot less stuttering and stammering than I'm doing, trying to make sure I'm getting all the information to you. She's got it down. And what that did for her was it empowered her to go, I'm not flawed. It's not because I'm not trying hard enough it's not because I'm not believing hard enough. It's not because I'm lacking character. It's because this is trauma. And she understood that and has been able to take these steps in. And so when you have that kind of strength and power, you can actually begin to lift those nervous system weights, right? This is nervous system exercise. And so what I'd like to do is invite Kara to talk for a few minutes about the activities that we engage in. We brought some gifts for you today that the kids made for you. Um, and that's so incredible. Oh, maybe I should do this. Yeah, so this is why kids need dirt, okay? This is why we all need dirt. We can talk about food security. We can talk about nutrition. We can talk about, oh, they're gardening, so they're choosing other foods. That's all great, and that's all good, and that's all true. But what this really does is it provides the social context that allows the nervous system exercise to go on so we can actually strengthen their nervous system, right? So what is social emotional intelligence? Anybody? Daniel Goldman. It's our ability to be aware of our own emotions, aware of others' emotions, and manage that, right? So I can tell if I walk into a room and somebody's having a tough time, I'm not going to be flippant with them. I'm not going to uh, be negative with them. I'm going to I'm going to attune with them. Like at lunch today with with Sam and uh, I forget the other guy's name. Kyle. 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 They did like attunement exercise, right? I don't know if anybody was I'm like, ah, oh, we're doing attunement. You know, we chant with the kids, we do singing with the kids, we do all these things to help that group cohesion. But they don't know that what we're doing is we're all kind of getting in the same rhythm, right? And so we talk. We open with a talking circle on each group. There's a specific structure of our group that has eight points to it. And I'd be happy to get into that today if we have time. I'm not sure that we will, but very specifically, talking circle. I'll give you just a quick overview. <coughs> talking circle, review of your goals. So we do a high-low kind of thing, a check-in thing too, and the kids decide what we're going to do about that again, so they have all pride and ownership of that. And then we review the goals. We talk about what the experiential activity is going to be for the day. Then we engage in those activities, the nervous system exercise, right? And then we wrap up with a meal and... Again, a review of another talking circle about how that went and how we're doing that and what that looks like. And what are you going to work on between groups? What are you going to work on between sessions based on their, their, their experience on that day? So again, just to review, and I'm going to review one more time because I really want to drive this home um, after care is done. But this increases, we see increases all the time in the emotional and behavioral dysregulation. We see it at a younger and younger age. We work in several different school districts and they're like, oh my God. This is incredible because we can help these kids learn to modulate, but it's not only learning them, we're actually helping rewire their nervous system, right? That makes sense? So, when they have that lack of lived experience, 
It's not just those kids that are upstream kids. It's many, 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 many of the mainstream kids that were getting calls from their parents at 15, 16 years old. What's going on? I know what to do with my kid. Because they don't want to tell them no. Everybody gets a trophy. They don't want to have that discomfort or what I call a shit storm coming back at you when I say, nope, you've got to be done with your phone. Nope, I'm not going to be done with my phone. And there's this stuff, you know, that conflict. But when we are able to help them learn, practice, and master these skills, they're learning to navigate those social contexts. They're increasing the quality of their relationships and communications with others. And they're actually seeing how that manifests in their lives. And as they experience that, that feels pretty good. That has confidence. That's actual achievement, and that increases their self-esteem. So the applied theory of the neuroscience creates social emotional challenges <coughs> and the neuroplasticity, which helps resiliency manifest and trauma decrease. So with that being said, I'm going to hand it over to Kara. That's the uh, video that has some pictures. Um, so I'll just kind of scroll through and then I'll kind of explain a little bit about what they are. Let me have stand here. I don't want to hear it. Closer. The video is going to be touching me. Maybe. So we use them throughout the winters. 
The kids' favorites are always pizza sauce, spaghetti sauce, those things made from our own Amish paste tomatoes, onions, garlic, herbs, and peppers. Um, we make our own applesauce with apples raised on the farm, pesto from the garlic and our herbs. Um, Pumpkin pie and pickles. Pickles, yeah, with our cucumbers and our dill. Pies with lemon verbena infused into the pie crust. And as always with pie, you have to have ice cream, right? Our favorite is lemon verbena ice cream to pair with pies. And we've done cinnamon basil ice cream and chocolate mint ice cream with our own chocolate mint. This picture of the two kiddos that Kenny was talking about earlier with the pizzas made from their own pizza sauce. And everything that we do, we try and make from scratch, too, um, as much as we can. Um, something that we wanted to bring and share with you guys are our winter solstice cookies. Unfortunately, we weren't able to, but they're really delicious. You can kind of just imagine it in your minds, but um, they're, they're made with <coughs> coconut and white chocolate chips, oatmeal, and then our own cinnamon basil. So while we couldn't have cookies here to pass out to you, we do have this. Um, so I'll let you guys kind of pass this around and you can smell it and check it out. It's pretty fun. Uh, like Kenny said, we always cook a meal with the kids too, whether it's on the farm, out over an open fire, or grilling in our kitchens and the office spaces that we have. Food is really important, and it's a pretty big deal. And the kids get to have a huge sense of pride and ownership too, as they get to learn how to use the ingredients that we grow. And then bring it home to their families too, and teach the families how to use these eggplants that they've grown, these white ones that they've never seen. How do you use eggplants? How do you use cinnamon basil? They really enjoy that. We have quite a few practitioners who are very creative and artistic. So our creative arts projects um, incorporate a lot of paintings, drawings, woodworking. Um, kids have made some pretty neat projects out of wood slabs. Um, and we've made pallet signs. Have, there was a picture in here, too, of a workbench that we made that we used to do our cooking on and things like that. Um, there's a picture in here, too, of a girl who was really excited to make her own hat out of a loom. So she knit a hat, but it, she wasn't just satisfied with a regular knit hat. She wanted to make it into a narwhal hat. I don't know about narwhals. <laughs> so we sewed buttons on her eyes and crocheted a, not a horn, but a tooth that sticks out. I did not know that they were teeth. Um, so we, like I said, make it novel and exciting for the kids. Um, another thing that we brought with us is we also make our own herb sachets. These, I have, you can feel free to take one of these too. They're made with four different types of mint. There is candy mint, um, spearmint, thank you, peppermint, and orange mint in here, and goat's milk soap. We make a huge variety. The ones that we have here are orange mint. Um, there's a rosemary mint one and a patchouli. I have some lavender ones in here too. So I'll pass these around and you guys can feel free to take one. Um, we're huge in experiential things using our five senses so feel free to use your senses with those except for maybe taste. <laughs> <laughs> um, can I add one thing here? Yeah. So on the cranial nerves, the first cranial nerve is related to the, our olfactory. And it's the only cranial nerve that goes directly to the brain. The other ones all have to go through other synaptic connections. And so the idea of essential oils and why that helps us calm down is because it disrupts everything else and it stops that. And so these kids take these herb sachets to school with them. And we've got permission and stuff so they know they're not selling weed or whatever. But, but they're just, because somebody got asked about that. But they just, they, when they're upset, when they're needing to calm down, they do that. So now parents are doing that too. And we have somebody else in the metro that um, we sent, the kids wanted to send a whole box to this author that's a friend of mine that's an advocate for poverty and homelessness. Uh, poet, maybe some of you know who Julia Dinsmore is. She has a poem called My Name Is Not Those People. And, and so she's passing out these herb sachets to her folks too. And it all came from these kids and that pride and ownership that they um, have experienced through this process called Dirt Group. So as you can see, there are so many different types of experiential hands-on um, activities that you can do to practice the different nervous system exercises. So if you don't have a space that you can garden, you can use a lot of creative arts things and culinary arts. We always say, no matter what your passion is, do it. Because the kids can tell, they can feel that, and it makes it that much more meaningful. Well, that's all I have. Can we finish sharing next about the outcomes of our research? Thank you. 
So um, the interesting part about this is I did this research for my master's thesis for my MSW, and um, I've been doing I've been doing dirt group since uh, 2000. So next year will be 20 years. Um, I did this research, finished this research in 2010, and I involved five different um, gardening groups from around the state, none of ours, um, but two, two, and I did some focus groups, I did some, it was a qualitative study, and what we determined was that um, the outcomes were very clear. Tangible results, obviously, in forms of fruits and vegetables and soaps and herbs, sachets, et cetera, right? Achievements. But really, also, we, we, we observed and documented increases in social competencies and increases in emotional behavioral dysregulation. Um, pride and ownership, the opportunity for these kids to belong to something bigger than themselves, and these kids are not kids that participate in traditional um, opportunities um, for a variety of reasons, but these kids are now part of something bigger than themselves and the pride and ownership and that they get to make decisions about what we're gonna grow, how we're gonna design the gardens, what we're gonna make, all those kinds of things, help them begin to make problem solving decisions, work together, and learn to navigate some of those things that are just normal kinds of skills that we have to have, right? Um, all the skills prepare them for life. These are all life skills. These are all sort of social skills, their, their emotional skills, but these are all life skills that help them to be able to navigate the relationships, increase the quality of the, the relationships, but really help them to be able to manage their nervous system in a way that they're not feeling dysregulated and overwhelmed, which is the most important thing. We provide opportunities for them to participate in the community. Um, all of the kids have participated in donations to food shelves, to assisted living centers, intergenerational things, to other things. In 2012, we grew over 50 turkeys with the kids, organic turkeys. Each kid took a turkey home. We made pumpkin pie from scratch. We did not use a food processor. We used an old Foley food mill. Um, we do everything as, as, as old school, if you will, as we can. The same thing with pickles, potatoes, squash onions they took all of this stuff home each kid had that to take home and then there was 10 turkeys left at that year we have more kids than that now but and they donated those 10 turkeys to a community <coughs> in wilmer to um uh, for a holiday meal for um, underserved folks in wilmer and they got to be part of something then that made a difference we know from bodies and bodies and bodies of research that kids that have the opportunity to participate in the community continue to do that throughout their lives. And so that's really important one because it's helped be a conduit for them to have that opportunity that's gonna be successful. In 2013, we walked into the food shelf in Hutchinson, McLeod County, Minnesota, and took a whole bunch of cucumbers, whole bunch of tomatoes, whole bunch of stuff, because we just have a lot. We grow a lot. We donate probably half of what we grow. And that's outside of the kids, okay? And so, these three people, these three adults inside, were just blown away, and they couldn't, they couldn't have asked them to do a better job than they did at complimenting these young people and helping them feel important and how much important it was and what a difference they were making in the lives of their community. This one young man walked out, and I swear he was four inches taller, <laughs> and he said, Kenny, to get back. That's pop -up. Then the last one, the reason I started Dirt Group. I was watching too many young people kill themselves because they didn't fit in. And we needed something that was equitable. We have land. We need more land, obviously, because that's the thing. That's the piece that makes it equitable. Because all of us can plant seeds and dirt. All of us can grow food that way, but not if we don't have a space to do that. And that's security not only forms of food security, but just sense of well-being and security, right? If we have food. I used to think I was poor growing up because I didn't have stuff like my, uh, my friends did, but we always had food. So that's not poor. We always had food. And so, um, but that opportunity for kids to belong to something bigger than themselves, they, they wear their t-shirts for like, we get t-shirts every year for them. Um, they wear their t-shirts for like four days in a row. Their parents can't get them off to get them in the laundry because they're so excited. <laughs> and when kids graduate from dirt group, it really bums them out because they're like, well, I'm coming back next year, aren't I? And we do it year-round, right? And it's an open group, so kids can join at any time. <laughs> we might have a five-year-old, we might have a 16-year-old all in the same group because that's real life. That's like the country schoolhouse, right? Yeah. Okay, mm -hmm. and that's where my older six, or my oldest seven siblings, six siblings, of the ten of us went to country school. Okay, that meaningful little house in the prairie kind of experience. 
But these kids having an experience helps them feel safe. It helps them develop that internal sense of security. But again, gang, social work with groups provides that social context, that social engagement on an ongoing, redundant basis that's intentionally focused. It's visceral, it's novel, it's action-oriented. And so they're getting the good stuff, right? And so, um, but that, that social inclusion, having that ability to be part of something, to be recognized, to be going, hey, hey, welcome back, hey, good to see you. We're kind of animated, we're creative, we're silly, all of those things, right? <coughs> the neuroplasticity and those five, six theories, right? All of that combined, that marinade is rich. John Dewey, in the early, in the uh, turn of the century, talked about how powerful experiential learning was, especially for, he used the word at risk, I'm gonna say upstream, but I'm gonna say all kids, because right now in our society, at least in the United States, and probably globally, we have this, again, this emotional and behavioral dysregulation that's related to a lack of lived experience, and so we don't know what's going on, we can't figure it out. Yeah, we can. We can, we have, and we need to be able to do this and incorporate this, and so we have a 30-year plan. Sounds a little silly to some folks, but we have a 30-year plan to get Dirt Group in all the public schools in the United States. Um, I want to garden on the buildings and the roofs in New York. And that's what my friend Patty Review said, garden on the roofs, Kenny. Maybe, you know? <laughs> but we don't, we're not going to be able to do everything. We're going to teach everybody how to do this because it's so important. And what we have seen is so powerful to see kids heal, to see adults heal, and actually manifest well-being in their lives and quality relationships and to not not have this monster cyclical thing going on anymore in their lives it's incredibly powerful <coughs> um, so again i want to review because this is so important how do we implement this okay again we have the applied theory experiential symbolic interaction with social learning theory polyvagal eco eco ecological systems and strength-based theories. We have the applied neuroscience, the eight ingredients of neuroplasticity, which I've reviewed a bunch of times already. Again, the nervous system, the nervous system exercises, the greenhouses, the gardens, the culinary arts. Um, I'm gonna talk about some of our partnerships, which are really exciting um, in just a minute. Um, we do a lot of woodworking with the kids too now. Um, have you guys ever seen people using like wood boards for plates at the restaurants or whatever now? Mm -hmm. To like present presentation stuff? So I got a bunch of wood from this guy. I started planing stuff with the kids, and the kids are putting the stuff on to make it smooth. And we have one of our partners. Two, one of our partners are two chefs, world class chefs, and they want to buy these from the kids to use in their restaurants. I'm like, yeah. <laughs> but we have six restaurants and bakeries wanting to buy our winter solstice cookies from the kids. We haven't figured it out yet because we build insurance, and we don't want to like. We have to have some other way to do it because the kids need to get paid. We, we've got a job, right? But this is also about economic development. The whole thing about Dirt Group is about youth, community development, human development, economic development, but rooted in social justice. And that's that equity. That's where everybody needs to be able to have a place at the table. Everybody needs to be able to belong to that. And we can create that opportunity. And if we can be that conduit, then think about <coughs> that ripple effect, that big ripple effect to their adulthood and what that's gonna mean for their own families. When you think about the one kid that you touched and you that comes back and goes, wow, I'm doing so good. <clears throat> think about all the lives that that person is inactive with. I've trained in restorative justice for many years. That bigger ripple effect, how it imp harm impacts so many people, but so does the good, right? And so when they bring that back, then they pass that on. They, they, they ripple that, they become the mentors. Um, and then, oh, so then we'll go to the next. Social entrepreneurship. And the Prairie Soil Youth Cooperative. We'll go to the next slide. So our partnerships, Dirt Group Global, Inc., that's us. Men, Menu Youth Gardens is um, one of my former interns, um, Ben Larson, uh, and his, um, Mark Taylor and Nate Erickson, um, three fabulous guys that are working out of Wilmer, Minnesota, working primarily on social entrepreneurial with Somali and Latino youth. Um, also, also Caucasian youth, but primarily um, working with underserved kids to develop economic opportunities through growing food together also. I used to run the greenhouse at the Midwest campus that's there that Ben runs now with these guys. And we have this partnership where we're growing food together. They're doing like, I don't know, 100 CSAs this year for the local hospital. Our kids get to participate in that as well as the kids that they're working with. 
uh, model citizen restaurant and youth farm is Matteo McBee and his partner Aaron Lucas. Um, Aaron is a French and Swedish pastry chef, and Matteo is all things chef. He's won multiple competitions. He's just an amazing guy. Um, they have two outdoor brick pizza ovens. We're going to go sling pizzas on the outdoor pizza ovens with these kids on Saturdays this summer with our own sauce. They're making their own sauce. They're growing the stuff. It's all together. And you think about all the ingredients that go into a pizza sauce and how long it takes. We plant our garlic in the middle of October. We harvest it in the middle of July. Okay. You don't get a tomato tomorrow from a seed you plant in the ground today, right? In Minnesota, probably like everywhere else, it takes about six months. Okay. We just started in April in the greenhouse. In August, we have tomatoes. Peppers, the same way. Onions. All of our herbs, we grow lots of herbs, and then we combine all of that, right? Similar to helping the kids understand that they're combining all these ingredients and the skills that they're learning to help them navigate their lives and their relationships. So it's very meaningful in that way. But again, go back to those 12 cranial nerves, seeking food, chewing food, swallowing food, digesting food, eliminating food. It's kind of crazy, but it's all together. And then the social engagement nerves, five, seven, nine, 10, and 11. Can't emphasize you to read Stephen Porges enough. Just cannot tell you how great that mind is. Then Crowover Family Services, which is our our mental health agency, and we're clinical social workers, but we we practice more like community social workers. I always tell people that social workers were social workers before they were clinical social workers, and it's really about meeting people where they're at. And if we don't meet people in their social context, I think we're doing it wrong. I don't think that somebody can come to my therapy office. And I, I, have, I have a lot of therapy clients, but if I can't engage with them about their social context, especially somebody that's, for example, experienced anxiety, how did they get past that? Because, hey, go check, go try that. And I'm not leaving my house, right? So we have to have these ways of being meaningful. And so we have gardens that we work with all of these folks, even our therapy clients in, to help them, again, develop that nervous system strength. Because from a neurophysiological standpoint, the neural pathways as they grow, um, they become stronger, increasing stronger synaptic connections, which is kind of like computer stuff, what makes things go faster. But the vagus nerve, number 10 of the cranial nerves, is myelinated, okay? So that actually, the myelination is like an electrical cord that has, um, the, 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 like an orange outdoor cord or whatever that has that casing around all those other ways. <coughs> It helps it conduct, conduct that information so much more quickly. And as we engage in this, and this is what neuroplasticity does, it engages the strength and breadth of that myelin sheath to increase the activity of the vagus nerve. Okay. Um, so I'm a little bit off. Earthrise Farm, um, two nuns that are friends of mine, I call them the Sisters Squared. They live on their family farm. Um, school Sisters of Notre Dame because they're actual sisters as well as being nuns. Kate and Annette Fernals, and they were in the slideshow too, um, have been such good supporters of us for so many years. For actually the, all the, I've known Kate for, since I was 16, I don't know, 20, 37 years. And I've known her sister for 20 some years. We have had the greenhouse, we take kids out there, we make sauerkraut with them, we make all sorts of different things with them. And that's where we grew all of our starts for many years. And then the school districts, many of the school districts, Brooklyn Center School District, which is a large school district in the metro, um, the St. Cloud School District. There's several school districts that are, thank you, that are um, really wanting and desiring to partner us. In fact, I just got an email as we've been speaking from one of the Brooklyn Center Schools that's really excited. And as I was meeting with these folks, I was like, can you do this work in our schools? And I was like, well, you know, I'm, we have, our gardens aren't there, our greenhouse is there. Oh, we've got gardens. I'm like, what? Yeah, we've got gardens at all of our schools, but we would love to have you come in and help with this. And I'm going, holy smokes. If we can get a grant for a greenhouse, we can install a greenhouse and partner with them. In fact, we own our own greenhouse that right now is sitting in somebody's shed, and we're trying to figure out where we're going to put that greenhouse, and that might be a great partnership. But we think about the St. Cloud area, the Wilmer area, and our Minneapolis, the, the diversity is incredible, right? It's very much like New York in those three communities. Not Litchfield and Hutchinson at all. Those other three are very much like that. And so, again, when we think about social work with groups, and the power of that group work and how much it, how important it is for us to understand each other, for us to learn from each other, to, for us not to live in fear of each other. These kids aren't afraid of each other. These kids are, are gonna lead us, right? 
if we leave them. So back to the 30 year plan, and it's 30 R Y R plan hashtag. I mean, that's the, the is that Twitter? Yeah. Um, you can go there and find out about it. You can follow it. Um, just started that one. 30 years. It's probably going to take that long. Okay. But if we can do it, it's going to be huge, right? Um, so our implications for practice, I just wrote a bunch of stuff down here. The last one is questions. And I'm just going to stop right now because I could give you six more hours of information because I love talking about this stuff. But I want to hear from you. What kind of questions do you have? What kind of thoughts do you have? Yes. Um, how do clients find you? Like, how do you, how do we have yes. to So, you? Um, a lot of referral sources, case management, but also lots of word of mouth over the years now. So, and uh, you're from the Twin Cities. Yeah. So, Washburn Center for Washburn is a huge referral source for us. Oh, Washburn cool. Center for Children. Yeah. Wilder Foundation. Um, lots of those schools. Yes. What's the difference in, in like neural plasticity between like the adolescence work versus like adults who have experienced trauma? So kids are probably more resilient. Yeah. Um, and, and maybe um, the one thing that really worked for um, the young man that was waving in the kayak was his parents were on board. Yeah. Okay. That's a big deal and you guys all know that, right? If the family's not on board, it's gonna be really difficult, but we can still work these exercises and still give them the strength necessary. But so, um, it's, it's a little bit more challenging with adults at this point in time because our heavily focus is on the children and adolescents. But the work that I've been doing with families and adults has been profound in the last year. And I just have more and more and more people. I have eight women that I see for therapy. They want to be in a dirt group mm -hmm. together. So, so it's, it's like possible. So Absolutely. Like rewire all that stuff. Oh, yes. Cool. Most definitely. Absolutely. Yes. Um, have you uh, heard of or read Dr. Norman Doyle? Brain's way of healing? No. You yeah. should. Would you yes. write that down for me? Sure. Thank you so much. Changing how the brain changes. Itself. Yeah, it's neuro. It's all about neuro. Yeah. So, yes. I was wondering about what happens after the children are better. Let's graduate. Say, they graduate. Mm -hmm. um, do they want to come back and volunteer? Have you kept track of them over the years? where their life goes they reach back out to us since it's HIPAA and stuff we don't do that but they reach back out to us one of the things that I didn't mention I should have had the slide of this is what the clock food truck we have a new <laughs> it's kind of fun we have this plan with our partners for what the clock food truck which will be an opportunity for those kids that graduate to continue on with youth development and economic development and job opportunities because everybody in this room probably knows that if you have a job in the food business those skills are transferable to anything that you would ever do, right? Mm -hmm. Everything, 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 everything. And so with Mateo and Aaron, we get to go to their bakery after <coughs> 2 o'clock in the afternoon and bake with them. So will teach them all that stuff. So we have these people that really want to teach the culinary arts to help young chefs um, to do all of these things. We have woodworking and stuff, all of these opportunities for them to develop those skills. And really then it gives them an opportunity to kind of feel it out what they're interested in, right? And so, um, that's that's a big deal. Everybody wants to stay. We have you know we have kids. I don't want to do this. I don't want to do this. So well, what do you do, do with those? We just keep them going. Oh yeah, um, you must have some initially resistant, yep. frightened. How do you handle them? Um, we develop a rapport with them first, and we take them at their, we meet them where they're at. So sometimes a kid might not start group right away, but what we have observed, and this is anecdotal, but what we have observed is that the kids that are resistant. Um, initially, if we just kind of let them soak with it for a while, they kind of come at their own pace. And because it's in a group, I'm not on point, mm -hmm. meaning I am. But if I, as I'm sitting there as a group member, mm -hmm. it's focuses on all on me, mm -hmm. right? And so then it becomes this attunement. And like um, Sam and Kyle were talking about today, how that attunement happens, that cohesion happens. And so when you're part of a safe, cohesive opportunity that's rich and it's interesting and all of these different things and kids like pizza and that's kind of hard i mean so visceral right very visceral but very healthy all of those things and so i think without having research that i think that's why that works does that make sense yes yeah you gotta stop
Um, I think this is the last workshop for the day, so if, if anybody wants to stop around. Yeah, we also have lanyards, different lanyards, too, if you would like to take more than four years and out. And then um, the post test for those of you who need CEUs, and then, um, I'm sorry, what is your name? Tyler. Tyler yeah. has the key for you, so if you did the test, you want to take the key, whatever. It's most important that you know, I want you to know the information. Um, and so that would be great. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.